Hey, you, hey, you, come on, sit down. You're sitting at the Growing Up Stable. I'm your host, Jesse Pimpinella. Thank you so much for coming on out to the show, on your couch, wherever you might be listening to the show. Uh, right now, we're in the middle of a severe weather advisory, so hopefully the Wi-Fi doesn't kick us out, but we're glad to have you here at the table. Um, we got a great show ahead of you, uh, ahead of us, I should say, because we're going to be here. Um, we got, we're going to be talking about the Roadhouse uh, remake, which uh, a lot of great talk to talk about with that, uh, with Conor McGregor's role, the action fight scenes, all that stuff. And then we're also going to be talking about the Beetlejuice sequel as well. Uh, the tra- teaser just dropped a little bit ago. A lot of things are swimming around there. Who's there? Who's not there? Uh, where's the story going to go? What's been happening for the last uh, t- for all these years since 1988, since we last saw Beetlejuice? So we're going to be talking about all that, making a little bit of predictions. But without further ado, I'm going to bring a, a good friend of the show on. Uh, he was on a while ago for our Home Alone show. Please give it up for Kyle Monsky, everybody. Give it up for him. Yes. Thank Kyle, you. you. Thank doing? you. Or you can also refer to me as Jack Burton coming to you on a dark and stormy night. Uh, given all the severe weather that's I know, dude. Today. I'm like, like right now, this this <laughs> it's like I'm like right. So if the windows blow out, it's gonna be an epic show. Uh, yeah, it's, it's gonna be. Yeah. It'll, it'll be talked about for sure. <laughs> yes, it will be out of the camera frame. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, this is uh, so. This is awesome. Like this part of the show, we like to just do some table talk and catching up. Uh, anything new in your life? Anything you've seen? Movies you watch? What What are you up to, man? Um, so ac- actually in terms of movies I've watched recently, um, I am, I'm not the biggest fan of anime, but there yeah. are certain ones that I do enjoy, uh, Full Metal Alchemist being one of them. Okay. I so I've heard about around yeah. watching the first Netflix live action Full Metal Alchemist movie. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was pretty good. I mean, that's just my opinion. I'm sure there are some people who are like, they missed this, they missed that not here for that conversation. That's not what this show is about, but um, I did enjoy it. And there's a scene in there that they, that they kept from the anime that is just as horrible and, and awful, even more in live action than it is in anime. So, and I was that's interesting. (laughs) That's interesting. Cause like, I think like with, with car, with anything that's animated, whether it's regular cartoons, animation, all stuff, uh, it's an easier pill to sometimes swallow. Mm-hmm. when it's animated but when you see the live action version it's harder it's a harder pill to swallow but some of these animes nowadays i i would go on to say that the animation sometimes is too gritty for me it sometimes i know attack on titans like when you see them gnash with the teeth and the people oh god it kills me i i couldn't make it through attack on titan i don't think i even made it through the first season i think i was just like "Mm, this ain't for me you know what Um, it is i don't even think it's so much the animation that's hard it's the noise it's the sounds it's the crunching the gnashing the screaming because like it's like a sensory overload when that happens i don't know about you guys have you guys ever watched a cartoon that really kind of got to you let us know but yeah yeah. I i know what you're talking about man that that's uh that's crazy. That's cool you're watching that, man. Like, right now, I think we're going into a new phase of seeing a lot of anime uh, become uh, live action. There's this yep. new push. You know what I mean, like, we saw Netflix kind of tiptoe with it with Death Note. Now it's it's getting pushed out more. So it should be interesting. Hell, maybe that's the new superhero trend. You know, maybe we're living at the very beginning of a new trend. You know, maybe we might get a live action Dragon Ball Z that's worthy, not the... 2009 version that we got that was like what i watched that one too because i liked the original dragon ball z i want i watched that i yeah. didn't watch any other series after that but yeah. i did enjoy the original dragon ball z and uh yeah i just don't feel like i i in my mind i just could not connect the characters in the story because that's that's part of what makes it fun to watch it come to life in live action yeah. it's like I recognize that. I recognize that character. I know them. I know what's going to happen. I can't wait to see what it looks like. And I, I just didn't get any of that from that movie. I at think all. the biggest problem back then was that uh, studios didn't believe uh, these things were mainstream enough to mm-hmm. get an, an audience on its own, that they had to mainstream the yeah. source material because in their head, they're thinking, we're going to piss off fans. But the fans that we're going to piss off are going to be. 20% of the people buying tickets. Yeah. And I think when they realized that number was wrong, 
that it is not 20%. It is a grand majority. That's when you started seeing this push for this needs to be closer to the source material. This the, the costuming has to look like it's ripped from the pages. Because and I think that really started in 2005 with Batman Begins and all that stuff. When you see Nolan and Jonathan Nolan, the co-writers go picking stuff up from the comic books, you know? Yeah. And that's why you see in Marvel and how they're picking stuff up from the comic books. And and a lot of movies and they're saying like, oh, this is adapted from this this run of this thing. And and it, yeah, no, I think it's it's very important just to get that because you alienate fans and dude, fans are the people that will buy tickets. They will buy tickets. I mean, yeah. and I, I think sometimes, and but we're living in a different time where I think you could be niche now. Yeah, you know I mean, I mean, look at how many YouTube stars, Facebook stars, and all these Instagram, TikTok. You know, they have a very niche market. It's not a huge market; it's a niche market. But when they go to cities, they will sell out. Yeah, you know I mean, but it might not be as broad as, say, oh, do you know who Brad Pitt is? Oh, I know who Brad Pitt is. Oh, do you know who Kamita Cody is? Maybe not really. Maybe I do. Maybe I've heard of him. But there's a difference, you know. So, yeah, it's 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 funny how the niche exists in every part of the world in the country now it's not yes. you know with you know obviously with the with the onset and the widespread uh reach of the internet and social media now um a, a niche can now you know expand across borders and countries and cultures and things exactly. like that so it's like yeah it's like how does this person sell it wherever they go because there is a large group of people that are a huge fan of that person in every town and state and country all over the place. And, uh, and I think that's, that's one of the positives we can take from the reach of social media and things like that. But, um, but yeah. And when you're talking about how successful Marvel was with, with, uh, with superheroes and bringing them to live action, uh, same thing with, um, you know, Nolan and Batman, it's okay. I don't mind if you modernize it or oh, course, put your own yeah. spin on it, but like I said before, I got to recognize what I, what I yes. grew up look, yes. reading and enjoying yes. in that. And that's what I did. And when I, when I remember when the first time I saw the dark Knight, or, um, our Batman begins, I was like, I go, Nolan could not have made this movie without watching the animated series. I'm oh sure. no. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And there, there was a, there was a deep love and respect for the, the source material and that's what came uh from watching we were like oh wow this is this is something i recognize this is something i like and giving a new take and a new spin and like they did a new spin on harvey dent's two-face it's not mm -hmm. so much that he has uh multiple multiple personality and i say multiple because people, people are like wait he only has two personalities two-face and uh um and harvey dent technically he has yep. three if you know yep. canon yeah uh, if, you can, if you count the judge yeah, you, right. which I always count the judge. Oh, what a absolutely. great twist. That twist went so hard for an animated oh, series. Oh, yeah, What? I, I was like, I well, in the animated series when they did it, I, I remember as a kid, I was like, what wow. That was, that, was, that was my first exposure to mental illness. Like, I oh. <laughs> I, wasn't, I didn't know what to think. He was, try, he was trying to off himself the whole episode. Yes. I was like, oh, my God. Like. But one of that was one of the funny things about that show. That show got censored so badly. And the rule that they had with that show is anytime something gets censored, they have to find something worse than the censor. Like yep. Joker couldn't kill people with gas, but he could put you in an endless coma for the rest of your life to your brain dead laughing. <laughs> and when you think about it, you're like, shit, that's worse. I yeah, would I rather it just killed me. I remember, I don't know if it was uh, Paul Denis or, or, or whoever worked on that show. There, I, I saw an interview with them, and they and they were talking about that. It's how, Denny or Tim, one of those two. Yeah, Bruce, oh, oh, no, it was Bruce Tim. Bruce I, Tim. I, I, thank you. It was Bruce Tim. And he goes, yeah, you can't kill people on this show. It's for kids. Okay, let's put a permanent creepy smile on their face. That won't damage the children. That won't damage them. <laughs> Or 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 Batman, I love the one episode where he has like an intervention with that mob boss. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, you're the he's the mob boss is like, my son was kidnapped. He's like, he was never kidnapped. He was in rehab because he got hooked on your drugs from your dealers. <laughs> and I'm like, holy shit. Yeah. Oh, I was like, not what I was not for today's kids, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Holy hell! I it was those so, like Bruce Wayne is working with uh, the one therapist. He's like, or the the priest. He's like, mm -hmm. it's time. <laughs> like 
He's come out of left field. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I would. I, would, I mean, good stuff. That, that, yeah, no, I, I love that about that. But uh, let's talk about some crazy writing, man. Let's talk. Let's talk about some crazy writing. Let's talk about the Roadhouse remake on Amazon Prime. Oh my God, I'm going to tell you this right now. It is my thought when I went in. It's look, Roadhouse with Patrick Swayze is a lightning in the bottle. Mm -hmm. a, a movie like that can never be reconstructed. If you go in watching this movie thinking, I'm going to watch greatness, you, th that wasn't the point of the first movie. No, no. The the, a lot of the movies of that time, that was not the point. That was a Roadhouse is the ultimate. You came home, it's 12:30 at night, and it's it. It could be almost over, and you're like, I'm gonna watch it. It was like it's like the weirdest. Like I'm gonna watch, even if you're watching the last scene where they're jumping in the water, you're like, well, I guess I'm gonna watch the uh, guy who's blind play that song, and while the credits roll, <laughs> like yeah, yeah, that that movie demanded reverence, my friend. Yes, right. and that and, and you know, kind of working backwards here, that credits that end credits with him just showing him playing that song live. That was something that was not done a lot during that no. time in filmmaking, and it was no, very no, unique well, and just another small detail, like you said, that that uh, gives that movie the the reverence that it deserves. Yeah, and, and so so it's like going in. I know I'm not going to get that movie. I'm not going to get Shakespearean lines like "I fuck guys like you in prison while you're choking somebody to death." Yeah. I'm not going to get lines like that again. All right, yeah. that yeah. was. Yeah, you're not gonna get a guy who is who had a he has like a PhD in philosophy, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah something like that. And he's, <laughs> and he's carrying around his medical history all the time. Yeah, yeah, he just yeah. gives it to the nurse. Like, who has a manila folder of every time they got hurt? Like professional family. wrestlers don't even do that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like that's the one thing is I loved how professional he was. I love how mm. he had like he also at the beginning of the movie, he also had like uh, a fake car, like he had the yeah. car that everybody thought was his car, and they're like, st like at the end of the night, there's like knives through the tires. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, because because he can't park the Merc out there. You got to get a daily. You got to you know? get a daily, exactly. Like, <laughs> like he, like he made ro like this movie for bouncing. All right, it was it was evolutionary. It's like how drummers feel about Whiplash. Like that's. <laughs> <laughs> That's what this movie was. Oh man, this movie was like this is the movie where like you could watch it and you'd be like, I'm gonna be a fucking bouncer, make five grand a week, and show up like a cowboy in and out of town, which is kind of what the remake was making fun of a little bit. Because even the yeah. little girl says like, you're like a cowboy that comes into town and gets the ruffians all. Yeah. Like I thought like, that was brilliant. But yeah. let me, without further ado, uh, let me give a quick synopsis of the movie. Spoiler alerts. Uh, so basically, uh, in this case, we had Elwood Dalton. They changed the name. Uh, was an ex uh, UFC fighter due to a uh, unfortunate uh, issue in the ring in his last fight. He has become very, very peaceful. But he, but like kind of Patrick Swayze, he's like, "Be nice, be nice." But mm -hmm. when you can't be nice anymore, be even nicer. You know, yeah. uh, becomes this legend. He he kind of shows up to fights, and he's like. He pretty much punks the people out of fighting and mm -hmm. takes the money, which is kind of a good scam. But and but I don't get that. I don't think he's a bouncer in this movie. Exactly. No, he doesn't he doesn't come into the movie being a career bouncer no, like yeah. Patrick Swayze's Dalton was in the original Roadhouse. And and I actually I had a note here saying like were there like no no cameos in the new movie? But I guess there technically was because Post Malone is the first person is like the guy he's going to fight in the beginning of the movie, yes, yes, and Post he Malone, pops yeah. out and he's like, "No, I'm not fighting this guy." Which I guess they're trying to create some kind of aura or legend around you know Jake Gyllenhaal's character as you know some badass. Yeah, I thought, I thought nobody that was wanted cool. any of that. Yeah, I thought it was okay. I was that was a cool yeah. idea. I but I do miss the whole career bouncer thing. I do miss that so much because like, because like, like honestly, uh, Roadhouse is an action version of Bar Rescue. You know what I mean? Like it's all it is. It's an action rated R version of Bar Rescue. He goes in there. He's like <laughs> he's skimming off the top. He's doing this. He's doing that. And then the guy's like I'm skimming off the top, and then like yeah. nose to nose. 
But like in this one, there was none of that. Like all the employees were cool. All the employees were cool. He didn't really have to make anybody leave, you know. Yeah. Uh, the one girl was like, like bringing him breakfast on the the boat that he decides yeah. he wants to sleep in and, and all that stuff. But so, anyways, so after the fight, uh, that didn't happen. The woman wants to hire him. Hires he 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 takes up the offer, and basically our our protagonist isn't so much our antagonist. Is it so much this boss hog who wants to take over the town? Yeah. He really drives his caddy swerving <laughs> down the road. Um, it's 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 a kind of a rich kid from uh, from his father who who he inherited his father's crime enterprise because he's in jail. Yeah. And they just want to build condominiums. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to take over the town. I just want condos here, and that's it. <laughs> I was hoping it wasn't going in that direction. I'm like, it's not condos. It's not condos. And then when I saw that fucking table, I'm like, it's condos. <laughs> the evil real estate mogul. <laughs> you might as well have just called this the you might as well just call the movie Up House. Up House. <laughs> That's all it was. It was just they wanted that they just wanted more. They con they wanted condos. They want that's all they wanted. Um, but yeah, no, so basically it's not working out. Uh, the father who is in prison is making all these crazy calls, which by the way, and this may be questioning because at one point he calls the Irish Popeye in Spain, uh, <laughs> which by the way, Popeye, that's great. I could not put my Popeye. The whole time. Yeah. Uh, oh, hold on gosh. one second. Let's see. My motorcycle gang ruffians in New York. Yep. It, yeah, they had. No, he. No, don't compare him to Terry Silver. He was Irish Popeye. We got Irish mm -hmm. Popeye fighting this thing. But anyways. So, but here's the question. He's calling from prison and he called to Spain. <laughs> can you do that? I don't know. I don't know if you can collect call internationally from a prison phone. <laughs> Like, I don't know. Unless, unless, they're, unless it's like a Brooklyn Nine-Nine thing where you exchange ramen for a cell phone. Yeah. I don't I don't know if that's like, I don't well, know if that's Well, it I said, do you accept the call? So it had to be yeah. a prison thing. It said, do you accept the call? Yeah. So man. I was cracking up because at one point he's like, let me put you on hold. And then he burns down the little village. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm thinking like, okay, he set a fire, probably beat the shit out of a few people. So maybe it's, it's three minutes top. So he kept this guy three minutes on hold in a prison. Mm -hmm. On an international call where they probably only get like five, yeah, only five. Right? If they're lucky, wow, yeah, it's, yeah, that's, yeah. I don't know. It, that's he must really love Popeye. I, mean, I, I, I feel, I feel, Conor McGregor brought the cheese that I expected in this movie. I'm not gonna lie to you. I know his performance kind of is what divided this movie. Yeah, uh, just because it's very cartoonish. What is your thoughts with Conor McGregor's performance? Um, I had some notes here. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think regardless, know, good or bad, there's notes. Yeah, so I, 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 it's just Conor McGregor being himself. He is not yes. acting in this movie from not my at perspective. All. Um, not at all. Which I did not, I didn't really enjoy. I, okay. I, I'm just saying. I, I, I no, would have no, tried speak, to put in a speak little your bit truth, of effort. my friend. Speak your truth. You didn't enjoy yeah, it. doesn't have you? to turn the volume up to 10 or turn it down to 1. Um, it just... I think it was just the easiest thing for him to do and they yeah. just wanted to make this movie. So my expectations going into it were very low. Yeah. Um, but the thing is that even with my low expectations, I still feel like he did not do a great job. Yeah. And here's the problem with recruiting people who fight in real life to do fight scenes in a movie. All right. Talk about that. What They don't know how to choreograph a fight. And when they try to, it, they get exposed. It looks terrible on film, and it's just not great. Because if you, one thing that stood out to me so badly in this okay. movie with all the fight scenes with Conor McGregor and Jake Gyllenhaal is that Jake Gyllenhaal's punches look better than Conor's because Conor is is used to making contact and following through, and following and through. He doesn't know how to, as they say in the wrestling biz, work a punch. And that's why wrestlers make great action, make great action mm -hmm. film 
uh, yep. characters because they know how they've been choreographing fights since they were in their 20s. And they, they do know it how on to the make fly, a lot how to hurt. They got to do it on the fly. Yeah. These UFC guys have been trained to hurt people their whole lives. So now mm -hmm. they're trying not to hurt someone. And I can see Connor trying not to hurt him because as soon as he throws a punch, it lands three inches from his nose and he goes like that. And I'm like, God, I mean, I know he's trying and. You know, I'm not Siskel or Ebert um, mainly <laughs> alive, but I mean, really, it's just like, I, I don't know. That that was one sore spot that really stood out to me. I'll have to rewatch um, that. I think I was I was enamored by the cheese because he yeah. did kind of remind me it just like I, I so I got enamored by the cheesiness of it. He's like, oh, <laughs> like doing no. that little Popeye thing. Oh, don't <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> He's, yeah, uh, I just like, felt like Conor McGregor was just doing a UFC weigh-in performance for like an hour and a half. Like that's what I, <laughs> that, that's what I got from it. That's no what doubt I got in the world. It. No doubt in the world. I I don't disagree with that statement. Here's the thing: I could agree with everything you're saying. I agree with everything. Just it tickled my fancy in the weirdest way possible. And yep. maybe that's because I went in with that low expectation where mm -hmm. I was like, "This guy is gonna crack me up." And I'm like, he cracked me up. He cracked me up. And because you, I mean, you're right, you're right. I, I have to watch again for those punches. And yeah, you know, because you're right. And I kind of felt like this movie is is what the Marine was for WWE. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, I I I love the Marine. Honestly. I love the Marine. I love the Marine. I love the Marine. I, I and like the Marine was like WWE's like we can make movies. <laughs> and then it's like every sequel was like he's the marine he's the marine he's the marine yeah. and then they did that with uh 12 rounds which love mm -hmm. that franchise and i love how they kept reinventing it even though it was simple like i love the one the third one i think it is uh it's randy randy orton or yeah where he only has 12 bullets hence 12 rounds and i'm like yep. Fucking, I love. It. I yeah, no, and, and and that's the thing. Like, like I said, what makes the Marine great is that, you know, John Cena. He has been choreographing action scenes live on TV his whole yeah. life, so he know he already knows what he's doing. Yeah, and then he's, and then he, you he, throw he, Robert he, Patrick in there as the bad guy. Yeah, sign me up. Oh my God, yes, <laughs> yes. And, and who is he? Some sort of Terminator or something? Yeah. <laughs> he does that like, weird look, and you're like, yeah. <laughs> And it's just like, again, that right amount of cheese. That's the cheese I want. Well, a little bit of cheese. Because at the end of the day, this is a fun movie. You know what I mean? There's yes. some movies you walk into and you know they're just going to be fun. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, when I watched the first Roadhouse movie, I knew it was going to be ridiculous. It's mm -hmm. a it's an action movie about bouncers. <laughs> like, yeah. it's right there. And this movie, and this movie, I felt like did that. And so, I mean, like I said, he. Conor McGregor gets into the story. They two, the two have their big fight at the bar, and then he wa he's going to walk away. But they burnt down the one uh, person's bookstore, and he's like, "Now!" And then it turns out he's like, "I've been hiding all this rage. I've been hiding all this anger because I've been afraid about what I'm going to do to somebody, and now I can do it." And then he just goes to town and murder fests everybody, and yeah. uh, builds like randomly starts building bombs. Which <laughs> he just randomly built a bomb that it's, can work to a cell phone or the clicker thing. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would, I would say, um, a couple of things, a couple other things that I noticed. Yeah. Um, that I that I really appreciate. Well, well, that one thing I did appreciate. One thing I wish it would have carried over from the original movie. Um, the restaurant next to the bookstore was called the Double Deuce. I thought that I was saw a that. Cool yes, reference. I saw that. I appreciate that. Um, what I didn't appreciate was that there was no Wade character in this movie. I really feel like they should have carried that over. Um, homie's going to need backup, and and they didn't they didn't bring it. Didn't have to be you know uh, Sam Elliott, but a similar type character. Um, maybe maybe they're they're doing what the Power Rangers remake did with Tommy, like how they set him up to be in the next movie. Maybe that never got made. Never got made. <laughs> <laughs> like, what a killer cliffhanger. What a yeah, killer yeah. cliffhanger. Like, oh, yeah, gosh. Do that. And I was excited when I saw that cutscene. I was like, yes. And it was yes. like, it like, like, never like, happens. happens. Um, um, the other thing that I wish they would have put in this movie was in the original Roadhouse, towards the end of the movie, after we hit that dark turn after Emmett's house blows up and things go real dark, he rips the guy's throat out. And he goes to Wesley's house yeah. and he goes 
full dark night. He starts picking guys off one by one from the shadows. He, he, he goes full Batrick Swayze, if you will. He just like Batrick just Battle. completely. He just and just takes them all out one by one. And I and I loved that scene. I thought that was really cool. I was like, man, he was like lighthearted, be nice. And then all of a sudden, we just take a hard left, and he's like, I'm not playing games anymore. I yeah. kind of wish there was kind of a part like that when he took it to Conor McGregor and stabbed the shit out of him, but it wasn't like a like a scene like that, you know, just things yeah. you really carried over. But um, I, I, I think the two, the the two of them had different things. Like, like I feel like Jake Gyllenhaal's Dalton, uh, he's a fr- he doesn't want to kill again because he was scarred by the fact he killed somebody. Yeah, I think Dalton, the other Dalton, Patrick Swayze, avoids fighting because he knows he's going to win and he doesn't yeah. want to go there. Yeah. And I, I, to me, that's, that's what I, I thought. Yeah. You know I mean, that's what yeah. I thought. Um, John brings up the whole idea the get away with murder. The town turns a blind eye. You can't make a film like that anymore. You're right. That That's an exclusive like eighties. You can get with away a lot of things. Um, I know John said you didn't like the film. John, fill us in what you didn't like about the film. I want to talk. And then also, I saw you said there's some CGI in the fight. I know everybody's, can someone point out where do they see CGI in the fights? Uh, like, are you talking about like, are they talking about like moments where there's like an action sequence uh, when they're flying off the boat or what, what, are, what am I looking for when I'm looking for CG? Yeah. I'm, I didn't pick up on that a lot either. Um, a lot of it I thought was just maybe like, you know, just some really intense camera lighting or, or like different yeah. camera lighting. Maybe that is where the CGI is. And I just didn't pick up on it because I was just so focused on, you know, how all of Conor McGregor's punches look like they missed from a mile away. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so for, me, just... for me, I was very impressed with the fight scenes actually only mm-hmm. because they were using a lot of one shot techniques, which I feel yes. grounds a fight scene so much because I think a lot of fight scenes have been Americanized. And what I mean by Americanized is that it's just it's quick intercuts of pieces of the fight mm-hmm. where you see my face then you see my fist my fist is coming back you see yeah. his reaction but like when you watch a one shot you see everything you see the connection mm-hmm. you see it. and that was something Jackie Chan who was a pioneer of that type of fight because yeah. people forget Jackie Chan quit America cinema after the movie Protector because he was just screwed over went back to Hong Kong made Police story one and two, which both are now Criterion, directed love them. those movies. I love those movies, and you can see that there is a there's a different way he shot those movies that made fight scenes come out, and I and I felt yeah. it did amazing. Yeah, um, they were Jason Bourne, no shaky camera. Yeah. I will give them that. And I, I will yeah. also give them this. They did not use fake punching sounds. It sounded real, like flesh hitting flesh. Exactly, and, yeah. and I and I appreciated that too. I don't mean to shake my fist at you, but like, like, <laughs> I'm it. I'm just like, oh, I was like that sound. I'm just like, oh, like, like, like it sounds real. So it's I will grueling. give them credit for that. It's grueling. It makes you go, ooh, like ooh, mm-hmm. and that's what I want. Like I, I thought the fight scenes were very creative. I, mm-hmm. I thought they were very creative. Uh, John says the film is set in Florida Keys, the motorcycle gang of ruffians. Who's the key? Uh, yeah, I, I know, I know, it's old people. I know it's old people, but it's Roadhouse. It's 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 Florida Keys are a tourist destination. Yeah, they're a tourist destination. Well, well, this is a guy who who's trying to take over the Florida Keys. Yeah, and you know they're they're building a lot of condos down there. Condos. <laughs> maybe they're the re- maybe they're trying to get that old demographic in that area of the Keys. Yeah. Maybe maybe the reason why you don't see those old people there is because there's no condos built yet for yeah. them old folks. Yeah, think about right. that. Ah! Who's yeah, gonna buy them? Who's gonna buy think them? About the you know uh, the, the the gentrification. Yeah, the or gentrification the, hasn't even happened yet. This is geriatricification. <laughs> geriatrification. <laughs> but the property value in the medium age goes up. Like we, like we haven't got there yet. We haven't got there yet. It's gonna be there. It's gonna be there. More condos. I'm telling you, more condos, yes. baby. More condos. All right. That's. That's what, but anyways, so uh, as for like a final sequence, man, the, the movie, uh, it's, the movie is just goofy because mm-hmm. it goes on. We go on a boat chase, boat chase to a dinghy, and then the giant boat crashes into the bar. So the, so what's so different about this movie is, is that the, the ending ends in the bar. 
while the original ending ends at the house where we have fat guy who gets attacked by a bear, which I don't care how drunk I am. Still a funny scene. Even sober. It's still funny. Yes. Ah! <laughs> the thing lands on him. I love how, like, he had... He just throws out from under it afterwards. Yeah. Like, oh, we're actually fine. And I kind of like that he's kind of like, yeah, I'm going to join you guys. <laughs> like, he just joins them. Uh, but, yeah. But, no, yeah, I agree with this. John brought up a very good point. There was no banger of a bar ballot. I agree. I can agree with that. We didn't get, yeah. but I mean, look at the her person we had on stage in that the original movie. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I mean, we did. I but that. So yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. We needed. We need some Roadhouse music. We didn't get it in this movie. This movie, I felt like, was trying to capture the cheesiness, and at times, I felt like they did it too much. Uh, too much because I'll admit, Conor McGregor at times I was like, What are you doing? <laughs> you know what I mean? like, like, the one scene is stupid where he just crashes into the, the coconut tree, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or he's just randomly hijacking student driver car, <laughs> yeah, or, or he just walks around with the golf club. <laughs> what she got from the from house, the house I mean, to, from the house to the bar, like, he's, he's just like, walking around with it, like. Like this time, I'm like, all right, all right, this, yeah. But we did get the meme. We got the TikTok meme where, hey, we're, we're checking out what's going on here. <laughs> where the fuck is everyone? <laughs> and we got that meme, and I'm so glad we got that one because there are so many hilarious memes of that. Where there was one where it was like, uh, <laughs> you and your friends, and you're in your 40s, promising you'll hang out after 8 p.m. Oh, <laughs> checking. Where the fuck is she? <laughs> and I was like, that's funny. That's funny. Are you guys um, open? Yeah, you guys open? Yeah. Uh, we have a truck in the, in the front door. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, oh my God, no. it's It was good. Uh, like I said, Jake Gyllenhaal, what do you think of him as the the protagonist? What do you think of him? Um, I don't think Jake Gyllenhaal is a bad actor. Um, but you can definitely tell that there is a style of character or like a certain acting style that he takes throughout each movie. And again, he either turns the volume up or down on that. Yeah. Uh, like I said, isn't necessarily bad, but it's kind of, he just has a certain way that he plays characters. Yeah. Um, and this is to me, um, it was uh, his character in Donnie Darko uh, who knows how to throw a punch. Uh, kind of so it was kind of, but I mean like he still had he still had his moments where you know he could throw a little humor in there like the uh the 25 minutes to the hospital thing I thought that was funny yeah I thought I like that out. I I felt like his character was still very likable um I really liked how he he was just kind of like an aw shucks guy who could really whoop your ass and I feel like that was perfect for this movie just because, like you said they they threw a big block of cheese at you with Conor McGregor, and he yeah. is and he is like, and he was the perfect kind of character to play off of because Conor McGregor so over the top, and Jake Gyllenhaal is kind of grounded in what his character is. So it's like you get that styles clash, that clear antagonist and protagonist because this movie was yeah. not is not one that's going to make you think. You need everything spelled out for you: good guy, bad guy, fight truck in the lobby boat on the dock done let's go home like <laughs> yeah no, no no this was this is one of those types of movies because a lot of people are now calling uh for him to be the next batman because of his fight scenes his physique okay. his uh mannerisms i mean I, they kind of looked at this everyone has like a, a movie or a project they do and then people go that's that superhero for Alan Richardson, it was Reacher. Everybody's been watching Reacher. Kind of mm. reminds us the bulkiness of of um, of uh, Ben Affleck with the dry wit humor of Kevin Conroy. So a lot of people are pushing yep. like, "Ooh, we want that." But then you got Jake Gyllenhaal who kind of uh, delivered that. But you know, who knows? Who knows? I think it's a very interesting thing. Did you? Did you kind of pick up on that at all? I know that was a big thing that trended. Yeah, online. I, I had I kind of heard that. I'd heard rumblings uh, for a little while about people mentioning Jake Gyllenhaal in the role of Batman. Um, Alan Richton has already been a DC superhero. Uh, he was Aquaman yes. in Smallville, yep. so mm -hmm. uh, he has had a little taste of that. And uh, actually, if you if you really want to hear about a very powerful and motivational story of how someone was starting had success in acting 
had to come back from a lot of personal strife and 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 you know trouble and and build himself back up into a success. Alan Richson's story is super super interesting. I have to check that I out. I recommend uh, you listen to uh, Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. The episode Ooh, that he was yeah, on, yeah, yeah, yeah. that whole story. Um, I think he also has a book. I don't know if he wrote a book or not, but it's it's great. Alan Richson's story is amazing, and it okay. instantly makes you a fan of him. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend people check that out. But uh, but yeah, I can see Alan Richson in that. It would role be sure. it actually would be his third time being a DC hero. He was also really? Hawk from uh, Teen oh, Titans. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which I loved when he got they killed. He be it was like yeah, kill me off. I'm gonna be Reacher, and I'm like yeah, forget <laughs> be the star of your own movie and all that stuff. I get that. You should. But yeah, no, this, I'm very interested to see what they do. I know uh, John said uh, he could be Nightwing, which is a possibility. He would be, because I mean, if we're getting what is to be an older Batman who, mm -hmm. who had Damien, we're thinking, okay, Batman started age 25, right? So we're thinking maybe 15 years in now. Batman's yep. 15 years in with this new DC universe. Yeah, you know, so I mean, it's quite plausible. You know, if you think about it, if you, if you know, you could be mid thirties, Nightwing. So I mean, yeah. yeah, I think that I think the age bracket fits right around there. Yeah, absolutely. I think yeah, I think Jake. I agree. Jake Gyllenhaal strikes me more of as a Nightwing type than than really a Batman type. Yeah, um, I I think I just like Alan Richardson is that just because he has just the dry wit humor. It's never it's never like silly silly. Yeah, it's it's, it's kind of like this, like, ooh, look how cool I am. <laughs> I mean, Batman's yeah. kind of that way. I love Batman. Batman has always been that kind of like, ooh, look how cool I am. You yes. know I mean? like yeah, for sure. Like anytime he has a good joke, like, like I remember the one line where Kevin Conroy throws a, a line right back at Catwoman in the Arkham City games, where she mm -hmm. was she said to me about breaking her nail earlier, not doing something, and then then she asks, "Are you okay?" He's like, "I think I just broke my nail." Yeah, you know I mean, like just to kind of <laughs> just have like a little witty banter and i was like that that's and and also the sarcastic humor because batman like i'd like uh the one scene i thought this is the one joke i felt caught batman perfectly in the live action two scenes where bale says i'm gonna pin the whole thing on you to alfred in dark knight which i thought yeah. that banter is hilarious <laughs> yeah, that was good and stuff. then uh in the snyder cut of justice league where batman introduces to alfred he goes Hi everyone, this is Alfred. I work for him, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> like, if there was ever a joke that understood their relationship, that yep. is so goddamn funny. That is so because yeah. I love it. Alfred is I'd never take Bruce's fucking shit, and I always that's one of the reasons I love him. Nope. But let's wrap up on this so we can talk about uh, another thing from the '80s uh, coming back. Um, so, uh, like I said, I for for this movie, I give it I give it three out of five. I give it a three out of five. It's not, it's not going to blow you away. It didn't need to be made. No. Is it a fun time? Absolutely. I think in 10 years, this will be the drunk movie people watch also next yeah. to the original one, which is, you know, so that, that was my opinion. What are your thoughts? Um, when I go into movies like this, where it's not some kind of like big old, big hype blockbuster, I don't even go on a scale of one to five. I go on a scale of, was I entertained? Yes or no. And yes, I was. So sure. Um, yes. I, I, my taste in movies is like, did it entertain me? Was I, if I was absolutely bored to tears watching it, then I'd be like, yeah, like this thing sucked. But at the same time, I'm not going to be too harsh of a critic. Yeah. I've got my critiques of Conor McGregor, whatever, but was I entertained? Yes. And I watched it start to finish and I was like, huh, you know, that wasn't too bad. That was kind of fun. Um, I, here's the thing. If you could watch it again, that's a good, that's, I think there's, yeah. there's three types of movies. There's movies you'll, there's movies, okay, I, sorry, four. Movies that you love and will rave about. Movies that you like and you'll watch again. Movies mm -hmm. that you'll watch once, say it's good, but you're like, eh. And then yeah. movies where you're like, fuck that shit, I ain't watching this. Yeah. And I felt like it was, I'll watch it again. So that's how I, yeah. I know John said, yikes, to three out of five. Hey, the, uh, this is my Superman three, buddy. This is my Superman three, okay? <laughs> I, I will go, I understand this movie's not good. I know it. it's not good. I didn't say it was great. I said it was entertaining for me. Uh, but yeah. But anyways. Can I, can I share some quick trivia about these movies? Please. Where it, was, it, please. Was, it was kind of connected. I don't know. I may be reaching here. But I don't know. I feel like both of these movies were seven degrees to Robert Rodriguez. And I will explain. Ooh. Um, yeah, expand so on that. 
in the 1989 Roadhouse, the um, there are a lot of connections to the movie Desperado, which in 89 had not been made yet. Uh -huh. The first band that you see playing at the original bar where Patrick Swayze is working in the movie, uh, they are called the Cruzados, and the lead singer was in Desperado. He was like the right-hand man to Cheech Marine's bartender at the Tarasco bar. Um, and then also in the new movie, Joaquin de Almeida, who played the sheriff, uh, his girlfriend's dad, Yeah. Um, he was Bucho, the main bad guy in Desperado. Oh, fuck me. So, yeah, that is him. Yep. So just, just a little fun trivia there uh, that I noticed. I was like, God, I know that guy. And I was like, oh, that's Joaquin de Almeida. I know who that guy is. So, yeah, I just wanted to share uh, little fun facts. Good stuff. Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, Tom gave it a two out of five bad actors aside from Jake, maybe the bookstore peeps and other bouncers. Oh yeah. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. I two out of five. I can agree with that. Like I, that, I could, I think in another mood, I could have hit that number. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, Hey, let's jump over to our next topic. Uh, the next one that's is the Beetlejuice sequel. Now we are living in a time where, and I know people say, Oh, Hollywood's just doing remakes and stuff like that. Here's the thing. I'm going to say this real quickly. That trend has been going on forever because a lot of 80s movies are 50s remakes. Yep. A lot of them are. So right now we're kind of in that weird 30-year period of time where we're now switching years. Now, I say that, I only say it to tell people the remake trend is not new. Is it getting sour right now? Yeah, it, it, it is. It is. The Point Break, we didn't need a Point Break sequel. I didn't need that. No. I saw it. It was dumb. <laughs> that falls into the category. I saw it once. I don't need to see it again. You know, uh, uh, you know, so there's there's movies that are falling into that. So now we got Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. It's a pointless sequel. My wife wants to jump in on this, Kyle, real quickly. <laughs> everybody, the one and only spooky, everybody. All right. This is a pointless sequel. It's stupid. And Jenna Ortega will ruin it. Okay. I'm done. All right. She hasn't forgiven her for Scream. She hasn't she forgiven her. She ruined my favorite fucking she franchise. Hasn't, she hasn't forgiven her. And, and, and Wednesday. You didn't like that. And my other favorite fucking franchise. So, two for two. She doesn't want Jenna to take it to be three for three. So I, yeah, yeah. My, my wife loves Scream. Um, it's one of those things where it's like me and Star Trek or me and Star Wars. Um, I just... I will find a way to love anything that comes out. And with Scream, my wife is the same way. She will find a way to love every single movie. Now, she will say that some are better than others. But, yeah, she I don't think she – it didn't ruin it for her, but, you know. Yeah. yeah. It, it, I mean, at the end of the day, people – what they want – Hollywood at the end of the day, and it's also our fault as people – because we give most money to remakes, requels, leg mm -hmm. legacy sequels, you know – there is no money for originality. There is no money. Because anytime there is a good original movie, we don't see it. I'll give you a great example. Um, and, and again, this isn't to knock any of the movies I'm saying. Captain America Civil War came out in March. And then later in March, the other guys came out. And then two months later, uh, or a month later, Batman vs. Superman came out. All right? Or maybe it was the opposite way around. The point is, no one saw the other guys. But it has this cult following. Everybody loves that movie. There is no doubt in the world. It's it's everybody thinks it's a great movie, but the problem is, is it came out between the worst possible time ever, and yep. and so what that tells Hollywood is that okay, we made a good movie, yeah, and it's a good original movie, but y'all went to go see the adaptations, mm -hmm. you didn't get you didn't see the originality, so we're gonna keep churning this out because th we we know this is gonna work, you know, and that and that's and that's a thing, so. It's a tough, it's a tough reality, but it is the reality of the situation. Um, but the, but I see a lot of people are split. John thinks it's unnecessary. My wife, uh, she's like I said, uh, split about it. sequel is long overdue. Uh, what do you think? Um, I'm kind of with John. Do I feel like a sequel was needed? Is it something that I was clamoring for? No. No. Um, but they are making it. They are, it's not that they're getting like a whole new cast of characters and new characters and just slapping the Beetlejuice name on it. They have Winona Ryder, they have Catherine O'Hara, they have Michael Keaton all back for this movie. Um, and, and it's like, okay, 
and I don't and I like to think of Michael Keaton as an actor who would not do a movie just to do it. He's not going to George Clooney I Batman agree. something. He's not. Yeah, he's if he if he didn't feel like this was going to be a good movie, I don't think Michael Keaton would have signed up for it. And, and he no, said I, no to other scripts. He has yeah. said no to other scripts over the thirty years. Guys, we almost got Beetlejuice goes to Hawaii. All right, that's a true story. All right. So that, that I'm glad you brought that point. Continue. Hey guys, let me give you my uh, <laughs> skirt here. Aloha, I bitches. A power necklace <laughs> going on there. Yeah, and say it once. Oh, say it just got rain. Rain. Hula hula hula. Like what the hell? That would have been awful. But oh we, we that script that? was written. That script <laughs> was written. Oh man, I would love to have that framed. <laughs> I would love that. I would like. I hear. Listen, I wouldn't want that movie to be made, but I want to read the script. I will. Oh, I will say I want the script. But, but yeah, no, right. yeah, unnecessary. Um, but I will watch it because I am, I, I'm definitely interested with the fact that they brought some of the original cast back. I like to see how they continue the story. I don't hate Jenna Ortega as much as your wife does. Um, so your wife will probably hate me now. No, you're um, good. You're okay. <laughs> but, she knows she's in the minority. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, but I I. You're, you're, I, I don't think your wife will be alone, though. I think there will definitely be some harsh critics out there um, that will be like, you know, I'm not really seeing this. I, I, I really have no interest because of A, B, and C. But, yeah, I, I'll still watch it. Yeah. I, 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 here's the thing about the long-awaited sequel. The problem with the long-awaited sequel is you're dusting off a fan base where the fan base Literally. necessarily wasn't. Here, I mean, here's the thing. I miss when movies were just one movie. Yep. I like that. I like that element where it's just this happened only here at this one point in time. This movie is by itself and I love it. You know what I mean? I feel but it doesn't say I'm anti-sequel. What I mean is if you're going to do a sequel, it's got to drive the story forward. It's okay. got to it I, I think the best person who did a good had a great idea to what a sequel is is um uh Vincent Gilligan for Breaking Bad. You know, he he got that idea for El Camino, Jesse's sequel to the series, very early on. He's like, nope, nope, not gonna fuck with it, not gonna fuck with it. But it itched in the back of his head for over five years. Yeah. And it kept itching till he could no longer. And to me, that's like you have a story to tell, and that's why it's itching for this long. And he told a phenomenal pro uh epilogue. To Breaking Bad. It's a yeah. beautiful epilogue. It brought me to tears. And that's why it was a good sequel. Did anybody ask for a sequel to Breaking Bad? No. No. Is it a great sequel to Breaking Bad? Yeah. I would say it is. Definitely. But that is. But that was an earned sequel. That was earned. It was. It was. The story was fleshed out. The problem is like. For example. I loved Hocus Pocus. I love that movie. Mm -hmm. The second movie. Did the second one really need to be made? I'm not. I'm going to say it's cash grab. I like the cash grab. It was a good cash grab. But yeah. if it if it quacks like a crash that grab, smells like a crash yeah, cash grab, it was a cash grab. Like yeah. it didn't propel the story forward. It didn't expand on the mythos of the witches in a way that I thought was that did it justice. It just kind of felt like, hey, '90s kids, you like this, so we're bringing it back. You know what I mean? Yeah. It wasn't something where I felt like there was a story to be told. No, there sense. wasn't. There and and you bring you bring up a good point with Hocus Pocus. Like that that is a one and done. Yeah, that, that's one and done. Honestly, like, we did it. We yeah, did it. I, I honestly, I was like, I was like, they're coming back. Like I thought they were dead um, yeah. for good. And and I and and the thing is about Hocus Pocus too is that it is. It is really just a modern take. It's a modern take on the original movie. It is it's not really. I don't really see it as a, as a full blown sequel. It's like, oh yeah, they came back, and everything just happened all over again. Oh, we got a song and dance number. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And again, and again, it it kind of felt like it felt more like a TV special than it did a prequel. It felt like the Star Wars yeah. Christmas special more than it felt like yeah. Guardians a sequel Christmas to the special. trilogy or a prequel to the trilogy. It just yeah. felt like it's this side thing where it's like, hey, we it's it, it's it's them, and, and that's the thing. Like, so my question is: is what story is to be told here? You know, is Lydia heartbroken over her father's death because that's because now she's stuck with her stepmother? Maybe she wants to somehow. Maybe Jenna Ortega wants to get 
close to the father again and knows about the history of that house and mm -hmm. maybe is trying to find the father. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe there's, maybe there is a story to tell. Maybe there's, because that's a story that hasn't been told. The first story was told through the idea of you're dead and now you have to learn how to be a ghost. And now it could come from a place where a character has died and they can't accept death. And therefore they must plunge themselves into a world of death. Yeah. You know, Dr. Sleep was a great novel or, and a great movie because it did everything opposite of The Shining in mm -hmm. every possible way. But it, it it expanded on Danny because it came from the point of what happens to somebody who survives The Shining? What does that person become? Who do they become? What, how do they live? There's, there's this great interest to that. And I think when you expand on it like that, you get a good product. When you don't, you just get a cash grab. But I don't know. Like, what do you think could be a possible premise for bringing this character back? And Michael Keaton loves this character. So the fact that he's back, I'm interested. I got to say I'm interested. Um, My take is a little different on what story could be told. This could be a more Beetlejuice-centric story. Follow Not on. necessarily about anybody in the family or the, the couple that lived in the house and were ghosts and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Because they also had a hard time accepting that they were ghosts. You know, they they had a learning process that they had to go through. Yeah. Um, but I think that this is going, I would be interesting. I would be interested to see this more focused on Beetlejuice himself. Um, I don't know if you watched the Beetlejuice animated series. Yeah. But but if they could take like if they could kind of do that take and dive more into Beetlejuice's world and have there be a conflict there to where he now it's it's Beetlejuice asking for help with something because something has gone very wrong and that and could be an interesting story can, that even he can't overcome um and as long as the same camp and hilarity ensues I think we're still going to enjoy it. And uh, I really trust Michael Keaton to, to make this as good as he can. Uh, yes, I agree. He's the only person I really trust on this movie. And the fact that he said it's, he liked it, he liked it. Good. Mm -hmm. My only fear with him is that sometimes he enjoys playing a character too much. Because Beetlejuice and Batman are very, are like, that's not acting to him. He'll, he'll jump at those at any time. So that's yeah. the only thing that scares me. But... But like I said, I I want to see uh, what will happen. You know, maybe as as somebody said here, Beetlejuice Juice will has to be the hero, saving or teaming up with Winona Ryder, saving Jenna Ortega's character. That's a possibility. Yeah, you know? I like that idea. Yeah, I mean, even the Beetlejuice musical, which I thought was fantastic. I saw it live. If anybody loves Beetlejuice shit, go see Beetlejuice the musical. It it it's really funny, even if you don't like musicals, because I, I feel like it it almost sticks its thumb in your eye of musicals. It makes fun yeah. of it because he's the narrator, which is the <laughs> best part. That's great. And, and it, it, he, so he breaks the fourth wall constantly with the audience and it's so funny. So if they, if they go with that sort of creativity, yeah, I, I definitely think, cause like, like, because in the musical, they made it, they gave a reason for why he needs to get married, which is the goofiest reason. Because <laughs> it's like a green card marriage. If he marries someone of the living, he can now live. <laughs> which, it's a, oh, it's, how poetic. <laughs> it's such a goofy. And here's the worst part the joke is that Lydia's underage the whole entire time. So oh, everybody's like, we get married. And they're like, Ugh. Ugh. no, 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 not like that. Like more platonic, just green card, just green card. <laughs> and then they're like, still doesn't make it better. Still yeah. doesn't make it better. And they have a song called cool. Creepy Old Guy. <laughs> like, but it's like, he's still the antagonist, as you can see. But like, they're, yeah. they're having fun with an element, they're driving forth. Yeah some sort of mythos that was from that world. That's what made it so much funnier, you know, because like he kind of just says, you randomly have to marry me. <laughs> yeah. You know? But in this, they're like, let's make it up a purpose. And then the purpose is disgusting and hilarious. And again, but point yeah. is, yeah, I think we expanding upon the mythos is, is great. And that's what they need to do. And my only concern is Beetlejuice is not a good person. <laughs> I don't want them to soften him up. He's a pervert. He is 
a horrible human being. Like he is lifting up the girl's dress in the first yeah. movie. Like, oh, hey, yeah. oh, hey. like I would say, like it's so I don't want them to forget he is still an antagonist at heart. I don't want them to nice him up for today's audience because at the end of the day, he's a freaking demon. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like he's and people were like, oh, he shouldn't act like that. Why not? He's a demon. He's yeah. A, he, he, what, he, our social constructs don't matter to him. Why? He's dead. So he can do whatever he wants. So I want them to, to play off that and be, and believe with that. And like I said, I know you got to be tasteful. You got to be tasteful. You don't want to be. That's why the musical had the whole creepy old guy song. Because, yeah, they have to acknowledge that creepiness. They have to. Because it is wrong. It is wrong. But, and, but they, they but it, you know, it was the 80s. They, they, they had, you could have that storyline. No one questioned why Marnie McFly was best friends with a disgraced nuclear physicist. But we, we rode with that shit. Yeah, the nuclear did. physicist is like, Marnie! Meet me in the mall at 2 a.m. <laughs> and bring a camera. <laughs> and we were like, fuck. Okay, Let's Doc, go. I'll be right there. <laughs> Let's go, baby. Hi, Mom. <laughs> we didn't even think about it. Nope. He just nope. Went we met a creepy old guy in the mall parking lot at 2 a.m. Imagine, you, everybody, imagine if you're 15 or your 16 year old kid. Was friends with the nuclear physicist, and he leaves the house at two a.m. with a video camera. Fill the car up with gas on your way back. <laughs> so I mean, so yeah, oh, the eighties were wild. You can have man. fun with that. You can have fun with that. Like, ooh, okay, that was it. Yeah, that you can have fun with it. Don't hide it. Don't acknowledge it. It was, it was what was okay at the time. Having a little fun with it, it makes it funny, and that can be very anarchic. Uh, very anarchy. Yeah, I mean, like watching Beetlejuice, like still just be Beetlejuice in this time period, and just be just like the fish out of water story. There you go. There's a fish out of yes. water story to be told. That, or I would say, yeah, if they can evolve him into some kind of antihero, like I feel like that would also be very successful in this movie. I think, I think that's where they're gonna go. Yeah, I think having him as the villain, they're gonna, they're gonna have him become good and I think he's gonna be kind of like very, you know. Still have his own stuff. He, very Loki-ish. Yes. Like to what Thor is. Like in Ragnarok, like he still has his own. He, he has his own agenda, but he's going to he's gonna go along for the ride. I think if they do that, I think you could make a really fun story with a lot of great humor, a lot of great heart. But again, it comes from creating a script that honors the first movie in every possible way and doesn't try to be better or worse than the first movie. Yes. Don't compete with the first movie. I feel like Clerks 2 did that very well. Didn't try to compete with the first movie. Mm -hmm. It just tried to be its own living thing. And that's why I thought it succeeded as a sequel. Be its uh, be your own living thing. Be able to be like, you know what? I can like here's how good Dark Knight is. You could start watching Dark Knight right now, but you don't have a primal need to go, I should watch Batman Begins first. Yeah, you don't need to. You don't need to. You can. It, you can if you want the whole trilogy experience. But that's a great movie to just pick up. You can pick up The Dark Knight Rise. Just start watching it. You know? I don't it, think I'll ever pick up that movie. <laughs> my, my point is... <laughs> I, like, I don't know point, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My point is, make the movie good on its own. Don't make yes. it, we're going to go see it because Beetlejuice is in it. We're going to see it because... We love Beetlejuice. This movie loves Beetlejuice, and it's going to honor everything in the first movie. Doesn't try to be better. Doesn't try to be worse. We're going to progress the story in a manner that 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 honors the mythos. I think when you do that, you make a sequel. Yeah, I think I think Star Wars and to a degree Star Trek were also very successful with that. Um, very very successful. And I'm I, talking I about I'm talking about like the the like you know original series movies and the in the next generation movies. They were very successful with that in terms of telling their own story. Yeah, there there are personal relationships and things that still kind of progress as the movies go on. Of course, but they're not so much as a forefront that, like you said, you don't need to go back and watch a previous movie. It helps if you watch the shows for sure because they do have some references in there. But it's like, you know, you you don't you don't need to go watch the previous movie to really know what's going on. So yeah, I definitely yeah. see that. And if they do that, then yeah, that would be. You know that that would also be a crucial element for success here. 
I agree. And then someone else brought up the idea. Maybe he'll meet his match with a new villain. That could be that could be forcing him to shift. That could be something good. That could give him growth. Bottom line is, like I said, honor the story, honor the mythos, push forward the story development. Again, development, not cash grab. Mm -hmm. Develop the story. Yes. If you give us that, we're gonna love it. We're gonna love it, and we're gonna want more. And I, I, that's 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 I. I think the best way to make a sequel is to never have it feel like a sequel. If you do that, yeah. you honor the movie. So, but anyways, that's all the time we got today, man. We had some awesome conversations about Beetlejuice and Roadhouse. Who'd have thought two things to put together here, two eighties films that are now going to be two, uh, 2020s films, 2020s roaring twenties films. Yeah. We are so, roaring twenties now. We're the, yeah. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? So, we're again very excited. Thank you so much for joining me. You have been awesome as always. We'll definitely get you back on here. If you ever have anything you want to bring to the table, always contact me or John. Okay. Yep. I've, I've discussed a few ideas with John, uh, put some things to put in the hopper, but I always appreciate you guys having me on. I always have a great time. Um, yes. And I love your show. And the new intro is badass. I just want to let you know that. I love it. Thank you. Thank great you. Yep. We're, we're, we, right now the show, we're doing a little glamorous makeover to it, changing it up a little bit. But, uh, like I said, we wanted to give it more show esque since we're growing. You know what I mean? Don and I are two sharks swimming in a fishbowl. We need to go see the sea now. That's how I viewed it. But, <laughs> anyways, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you, everybody who's, uh, left the comment section. Um, if you want to catch me live doing shows, you know, here's how you can catch me go to jessepimpinella.com. Uh, this I'm gonna be I'm gonna be all over the place. I'm gonna be in Conneaut, Ohio, uh, Nashville, Tennessee, uh, Cuyahoga Falls. Uh, I'm gonna be in Columbus Funny Bone last Tuesday of the month. Uh, then I'm gonna be uh, in Bowling Green, Kentucky. I'm all over the place. Find me, and I got updates for my new special. We're gonna check for pitcher lock tonight, and once we have the sound, we'll soon have a release date for it. So stay tuned everybody but until then i'm jesse you've been sitting at the growing ups table thank you and have an awesome night everybody take care take care